SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule carrying four private citizens plunged through Earth's atmosphere Saturday night and splashed down off the east coast of Florida, closing out the company's first all-civilian mission in space. The mission called Inspiration4, which serves as a multi-million dollar fundraiser for St. Jude Children's Hospital blasted off on a Falcon 9 rocket from NASA's Kennedy Space Center on September 15. The Crew Dragon carried four people on board, none of whom are astronauts employed by a government agency or company. The crew was buckled inside SpaceX's Crew Dragon Resilience, reusing the spacecraft that sent four government astronauts to the International Space Station nearly a year ago. Roughly two minutes and 45 seconds after liftoff, Falcon 9's first stage booster returned to Earth for a landing on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. Nine minutes and 30 seconds later, the Crew Dragon capsule separated from the rocket's second stage, sending the Inspiration4 crew further toward orbit. During the crew's three-day trip in orbit, roughly 590 kilometers high, they gathered data for a scientific study examining how microgravity affects the human body. During a live stream update on September 17, crew member Haley Arsenault showed off a device the crew was using to measure cranial pressure. They also chatted with St. Jude patients, rang the bell on the New York Stock Exchange, and kept in touch with friends and family. Since Inspiration4 was not headed to the International Space Station, SpaceX replaced its docking port at the nose with a giant dome window, giving the passengers a 360-degree view of space while in orbit. Everything went nearly without a hitch during the mission, besides an issue with the capsule's waste management system which was quickly resolved. With the amateur crew strapped inside, SpaceX's Crew Dragon began its fully autonomous re-entry process on September 18, when it ditched its trunk and fired a set of thrusters to lower itself out of orbit and toward Earth's atmosphere. The crew's journey back to Earth appeared uneventful. Crew Dragon streaked across the skies above northeast South America and zoomed toward the Cape Canaveral coast. An initial set of two parachutes deployed as planned, slowing the capsule from 565 to 160 km per hour. Those parachutes were ditched less than a minute later at an altitude of nearly 550 meters and replaced by another deployment of four main parachutes, which worked to slow the spacecraft down before splashdown. The splashdown wrapped up the 71 hours long Inspiration4 mission after its September 15 launch. The capsule was hoisted out of the water and onto SpaceX's boat roughly a half hour after splashing down. After that, recovery teams opened Crew Dragon's hatch door and guided the crew out on a platform one by one, Arsenault leading the pack. The crew was in high spirits after stepping out of Crew Dragon and they'll all get checked out by medical personnel and flown in a helicopter back to land. With a surprising announcement just hours after the splashdown, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk helped achieve the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital fundraising goal of the Inspiration4 space flight. SpaceX is planning another civilian flight sometime early next year. That mission is a partnership with Axiom Space that will ferry a crew of four private citizens on a journey to the International Space Station. As part of the Shenzhou-12 mission, three Chinese astronauts safely returned to Earth on September 17, after completing the first crewed mission aboard the Chinese space station. The Shenzhou-12 mission was launched on June 16 and arrived seven hours later at Jianhe, the core module of the Chinese space station. The Shenzhou-12 crew commanded by Nai Haixing spent 90 days aboard the station, staying aloft about three times longer than any previous Chinese crewed space flight. The Shenzhou-12 mission objectives included verifying regenerative life support systems aboard the station, equipment installation for future missions, numerous experiments, Earth imagery, and two extravehicular activities. Shenzhou-12's return to Earth was a multi-day affair. The spacecraft detached from the core module on September 15 and then performed a radial rendezvous test with the space station assembly, successfully verifying the radial rendezvous technology for subsequent manned flights. The radial rendezvous test did not include docking, instead, it validated sensors and guidance systems, measurement accuracy, and determined variables such as lighting conditions when approaching the station from below with respect to the Earth. Shenzhou-12 halted its radial approach before docking and flew away from the station as the three-man crew readied for re-entry. The return capsule then entered the Earth's atmosphere and the main parachute opened around 10 kilometers above the ground, with the heat shield jettisoned at around 5.5 kilometers up. The landing occurred within the time and area indicated by airspace closure notices, and the ground search and rescue team swiftly located and secured the capsule after touchdown. The Shenzhou-12 mission was the first of four crewed missions planned for 2021-22 as China assembles its first permanent space station. As the Shenzhou-12 mission returned to Earth, China is preparing to launch its second space station cargo mission. 
A long March 7 rocket topped with the Tianzhou-3 cargo spacecraft has rolled out to its pad at the Wenchang Satellite Launch Center on September 15. Tianzhou-3 is the fourth of 11 missions designed to build China's three-module Tiangong space station. Tianzhou-3 will bring supplies, equipment, and propellant to help get the space station ready for its next crewed visit, which is coming up soon. Tianzhou-3 launch is targeted for September 20, and if all goes according to plan, all 11 launches will be complete, and the Chinese space station will be fully assembled in 2022. NASA is moving ahead with plans to bring competition into the development of landers for its Artemis moon program. On September 14, NASA announced that it had selected five U.S. companies to help the agency enable a steady pace of crewed trips to the lunar surface under the agency's Artemis program. This opportunity is distinct from the initial crewed lunar landing demonstration mission contract awarded to SpaceX in April. According to NASA, the contract will be for operational missions to the lunar surface following SpaceX's demonstration missions. The total combined value for the awards is $146 million, and the work will be conducted over the next 15 months. Three of the awardees are part of the so-called national team led by Blue Origin, which received $25.6 million. Lockheed Martin received $35.2 million, and Northrop Grumman received $34.8 million. Dynetics, another HLS bidder, received $40.8 million, and SpaceX received $9.4 million. The selected companies will develop lander design concepts, evaluate their performance, design, construction standards, interfaces, safety, and medical capabilities. The companies will also mitigate lunar lander risks by conducting critical component tests and advancing the maturity of key technologies. The awards come about five months after NASA selected SpaceX to refine its Starship vehicle for a demonstration moon landing and a subsequent crew landing on the moon. To retain a competitive environment, NASA said it would move to procure recurring landing services from American companies. European Space Agency is performing the first combined test in preparation for the inaugural flight of Ariane 6, Europe's next-generation launch vehicle. This test confirms the electrical and mechanical equipment required for integration of the upper part of the launch vehicle. A major step of this test involves the closure of the Ariane 6 fairing around the payload. The fairing, built by Ruag Space in Switzerland, stands 20 meters high and 5.4 meters in diameter. It protects payloads from the thermal, acoustic, and aerodynamic stresses on the ascent to space. This combined test was performed using a new integration dock, composed of a large white frame with two mobile platforms adjustable to any level and accessible by fixed stairs and platforms. Ariane 6 is designed to extend guaranteed access to space for Europe and will be capable of carrying out all types of missions to all orbits. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. The Starship Booster 4 and Ship 20 are back at the launch site and workers are preparing them for ground tests. Even though Elon Musk mentioned a possible booster static fire test, the test did not take place last week for unknown reasons. Road closures are scheduled throughout this week, so if all goes according to the plan, we can witness the cryo-proof and static fire tests of Booster 4 in the coming days. Surprisingly, on Saturday, Booster Raptor Center engine number 67 was removed from the vehicle and transported to the build site. And the next day, Raptor 64 was delivered to the site to replace the removed engine. Ship 20 has been the subject of recent updates and upgrades in the last few days. Thermal protection tile works on Ship 20 are 99% complete, with a few tiles missing on the engine skirt, aft flap, and around the ship lifting points. A new Raptor engine was installed on the ship last week. The ship currently has two center Raptors and one Raptor vacuum installed onto it. Ship 20 ground tests will most likely begin only after all six engines are installed. On September 17, the Federal Aviation Administration released a draft environmental review of SpaceX's plans for orbital launches from South Texas. The long-awaited procedural step is the first of several regulatory hurdles that SpaceX must clear before obtaining final permission for the orbital test flight of Starship. The document, formally called a Draft Programmatic Environmental Assessment, evaluates public safety, national security or foreign policy concerns, insurance requirements for the launch operator, and potential environmental impact. It also reviews debris recovery, the integration tower and other launch-related construction, and local road closures during Starship activities. For the large majority of these analyses, the FAA document finds no significant impacts. The impact of noise on surrounding communities was believed to be one of the biggest concerns.
but an independent assessment found noise levels to be manageable. One exception was found in the category of biological resources. The FAA has found that the proposed action would harm species and critical habitat listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. However, there may be ways to mitigate these impacts. The company will likely be required to hire a biologist to monitor wildlife during construction and testing, as well as implement other measures that could reduce the environmental effects of test and launch activities. Also, pre- and post-launch biological surveys would be conducted within one mile of the vertical launch area. While a lot can go wrong during a flight, SpaceX and the FAA view a fire on the launch pad as the most likely anomaly. Another potential area of concern is excessive road closures of Highway 4. SpaceX proposed that the closures would occur on an intermittent basis, up to 500 hours per year, and an additional 300 hours of closure could be used exclusively to address anomalies. Based on the analysis, the FAA has made the preliminary determination that the proposed action would not result in significant impacts. However, the FAA is consulting with officials and is also seeking public comments for a final decision. The FAA did warn SpaceX about constructing the integration tower before the environmental review since it could determine that the tower was a hazard and not be approved. However, the draft states that the tower will not pose a significant effect within the area. The draft also revealed some of the future plans of SpaceX at Starbase. New additions to the vertical launch area are expected to be a second orbital launch pad, redundant landing pad, a desalination plant, and additional support buildings. SpaceX plans to expand the solar farm near the build site to provide power for both the production and launch sites. A payload processing facility is also expected to be constructed near the production site. The draft states that SpaceX currently targets around five Starship Super Heavy launches annually, but this could change as the program evolves and the launch manifest expands. The document suggests the company may eventually land its Super Heavy booster downrange on a platform in the Gulf of Mexico, and Starship may land in remote islands in the Pacific Ocean. The draft concludes that the FAA's proposed action is to issue one or more experimental permits to SpaceX that would allow the company to launch and land Starship and Super Heavy vehicles. With the release of the draft comes a public comment period, allowing the public to look over what the FAA has assembled and raise concerns, questions, or comments. All comments or questions are due by October 18. Moving on to other Starship updates, works on the booster catching arm is in progress at the launch site. All the four extensions of the booster catching arm carriage are now joined together. It is speculated that the carriage, operated through a pulley, will ride along the rails on the tower columns, moving the booster catching arm up and down. Furthermore, a launch tower graphics represented in the recently released FAA draft confirms this idea. As illustrated in this drawing by Lunar Caveman, a piston cylinder mechanism that connects the carriage and catching arms will move the arms during mid-air booster catching. Tank threads on the arm will move the booster towards the launch mount as the carriage lowers the booster. On September 17, a GSE tank insulation shell was transported to the launch site during road closures. This shell will be used to insulate the GSE tank designed to store the liquid nitrogen required for ground tests. A Raptor installation stand built to help change engines on the booster was also delivered to the launch site on Friday. GSE tank number 8 is now fully assembled at the built site and it will be transported to the launch site soon. Works on the Super Heavy Booster 5 have already begun inside the high bay. The integration of the common dome and oxygen tank sections is currently underway and as of September 18, the booster is 16 rings tall. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.